What's the big deal about Jesus? Why do I feel so empty? Isn't the Bible just an old fairy tale? What is the meaning of life? What happens after this life? After all I've done, do you still love me? God, can you hear me? If you could ask God one question, what would it be? Good evening and welcome to the One Question Live event. My name is Clint Davis and I'm one of the ministers here at the Linda Road Church of Christ in Meridian, Idaho. Over the last several weeks, we have posed the question to our community. If you could ask God one question, what would it be? We've asked this question over so social media. We've put up billboards in our area. We've, we've asked it through bumper stickers and t-shirts and we've sent out postcards in the mail. We've just interacted with our friends and neighbors. And we have received a ton of responses, and we're excited to share those responses with you this evening. We have several people here with us in the building tonight. We appreciate you all taking the time out of your evening to be here with us. But we also assume that we have many people watching online. And we just thank you so much for taking your time to be with us, to have your questions answered. This is our final night of four nights. This is our second session tonight. And in these sessions, over these four nights... Our objective has been to do just that. We want to answer your questions. We've taken all the questions that we've asked and placed them into the top 12 categories. And what we want to do is give you the very best answer we can from God's Word, from the Bible. And we're going to give you these answers presented to you by four very qualified, very, very capable speakers. Now, you might hear a statement like that and be a little bit skeptical. You might wonder if God's Word really has your answers. You might wonder if, if God's Word really has the answers to the questions that you have. And that's totally okay. We understand that. We believe that God is not afraid of our questions. But we also believe that God has the answers that we're looking for. So tonight, you might hear something that you don't believe. You might hear something you've never heard before. You might hear something that you have some doubts about. And again, that's totally okay. We want to continue the dialogue with you. We want to continue to interact with you. And, and if possible, sit down and study with you and so we can all learn and grow together. In fact, we want to continue this dialogue, keep this dialogue open so much that we're going to give you four avenues to continue to ask your questions even during this live presentation. That is for you all who are watching online and for you all sitting here in the audience this, this evening. If you're a Twitter user, you can follow us at One Question Idaho. That's the number one question Idaho on Twitter. Or you can search on Twitter just using the hashtag OneQuestion. You can also continue to ask your questions on the website, the OneQuestion.net site. If you're watching right now on Facebook Live, feel free to put your questions in the comments section down below, and we can field your questions that way. Or if you'd like to, you can text us a question at 208-614-1639. Again, that's 208-614-1639. One six three nine, and we will give you a voice later in our broadcast this evening. We're going to ask our speaker to give us a few minutes at the end of his presentation to field some of your questions. So again, if if something if, if you hear something tonight that, that that sparks your interest or something that raises another question, please feel free to interact with us using any of these four ways. And again, thank you so much for being here with us this evening on behalf of the Linda Road Church of Christ and on behalf of OneQuestion.net, and we look forward to answering your question. We want, to, we want to invite you now to watch this short video clip as we begin to do that, just as we begin to do just that, to answer your questions. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do good things happen to bad people? Why did I lose my only brother? Why did I lose my sister? My brother, at such a young age. Is heaven real? If God is a loving God, if God is a loving God, why is there a hell? Why is there a hell? Why is there a hell? If God is a loving God, if God is a loving God, if God is a loving God, why do we suffer? Why do I suffer? Why do I suffer? Why do I continue to struggle with jealousy? Why do I continue to struggle with transparency? With lying? Gossip? Openness? Doubts. Honesty. Why do I continue to struggle with pornography?
Can I be gay and a Christian? As a Christian, how should I respond? How should I respond to those who are gay? To those who are gay. To those who are gay. To my friend who is gay. What will happen? What will happen? What will happen on Judgment Day? What will happen on Judgment Day? Good evening, everyone, and welcome to One Question, the live event. We're really glad that you are here with us this evening, whether you're sitting in the audience or whether you're live streaming with your uh, notebook at home or your computer. We're just glad that you are here with us this evening. My name is Richard Sutton, and I'm one of the ministers for the Linda Road Church of Christ here in Meridian, Idaho. We're the ones that are sponsoring this live event. On the stage here this evening with us is Dr. Denny Petrillo. Uh, good evening, Dr. Denny. Good evening. We're really glad that you are here with us this evening. Uh, I know that you've uh, traveled quite a way from Denver, and so we're just glad that you're here. Always enjoy coming to Idaho. Listen, Dr. Petrillo is the president as well as an instructor at the Bear Valley Bible Institute of, of Denver. He's also one of the premier exegetes of the original languages in Hebrew as well as Greek. And he's unparalleled when it comes down to information about how we got the Bible and so forth. But he's just an incredible man when it comes down to being a student of the Bible and as well as his love for the Word of God. Well, being the president of the Bear Valley Bible Institute of Denver, tell us a little bit about the Institute itself. It was started in 1965, and it is like a seminary. It's for adults who want to prepare <laughs> themselves for ministry either as a, a, an evangelist, a preacher, or a missionary. And uh, I've been there since 1985, so I've been there for 33 years and have been the uh, president of the school since 2004. But it's, uh, it's got a collection of um, men and women that come with an interest in studying the Bible, preparing themselves uh, for various ministry opportunities. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, it's a two-year curriculum that is there. Um, but what he didn't tell you is that in this two-year curriculum, they do like 128 semester hours of Bible and Bible-related material. That's four years of college in two years. So it's like a job in itself just to go to the school, which means the men and women that go to that school there, they have to be very dedicated to looking for truth. That's the best part of the school is the kind of people that come, <laughs> is they're really committed to learning the Bible and dedicating themselves and it is four years crammed into two years. It really is. Yeah, listen, um, when you talk about students that go to the school and so forth, uh, no doubt uh, they, go there and they go there with lots of questions. I mean, they really have a lot of questions. They may go there with some preconceived ideas oh, yeah. or maybe some pre preconceived ideas of what truth is and so forth. And then they run into guys like you and your fellow instructors and so forth, and they learn a lot of things they didn't know about. That's so true, and one of the things that we know about our university system is you'll go to these various venues, some maybe a seminary or some university or college, and you have this teacher who's got all of these academic credentials, he's got all these letters out after his name, and it can be very intimidating. And the one thing that is important is God has the highest degree, <laughs> and I don't care how much learning someone has, they still have to answer to God, and they still are going to be uh, accountable for what it is that the Bible says. Yeah. Well, listen, over the years with working with the Institute and being a, <clears throat> a, a teacher as well as a preacher, uh, no doubt you've heard uh, hundreds and hundreds, maybe even thousands of questions. Well, over the last month and a half or so, we here at the Linda Rowe Congregation have been asking our community one simple question. And the question was, if you could ask God any one question, what would that be? We wanted to hear from them. Oftentimes we're asking them questions, but we wanted them to ask us questions. And they asked us a lot of questions. And some of the questions, they're at the top of the, uh, at the, top of the list in terms of categories, and 12 categories actually, the Bible and, and what people thought about the Bible was near the top. I think it was like in second place. And uh, they had lots of questions, questions like, like this. What makes you think that the Bible is right and superior to all other religious writings? One fellow said, the Bible is just a bunch of made up stuff by mankind. Uh, another one said, how do you explain the hundreds of contradictions in a book supposedly written by Jesus? I think you might have answered that last session. Why should we accept the Bible as the authority for us today to direct my life? And that's what you're going to be talking about in this next session is the authority of the Bible. So 
Dr. Petrillo, why do you suppose uh, people have such a, a hard time with recognizing the Bible as the authority to give direction for their lives? I don't think people like authority of any kind. And we live in a culture today that is very resistant to authority. We don't like the government telling us what to do. We don't like uh, to be told what to do in the workplace. We don't like to be told, even in the family dynamic, there are a lot of people that are resistant to uh, parental authority. So we're, we're in a, a day and age today that people just don't like to be told what to do. And so if the Bible is something that's going to tell you what to do, mm -hmm. what to believe, how to worship, and so on, uh, there's a resistance to that uh, sort of, you know, authority in our lives. Right. I, I, a while back, my wife and I were in our, I think it was in our breakfast nook, and we were discussing about the Bible, and we were discussing about how it seems like society is becoming more secular all the time, and how it seems as though God is being jettisoned from our society. And we were talking about, say, for instance, like the Ten Commandments, how they started, you know, they started to get them off of courthouse lawns and yes. our parks and all those kinds of things. And, and I said to her, I says, I don't get it what, what their problem is with, with the Ten Commandments. What's wrong with, you know, not, you know, not coveting your neighbor's wife? What's wrong with not lying? What's wrong with not stealing? What's wrong with not killing? Or what's, what's the problem there? And my wife said to me, I thought she was really insightful. She said, you know, it's not the problem. Not, people don't have a problem with the rules. They don't like the God who wrote the rules. They don't like being told what to do. They don't want to think that there's someone higher than them that actually has the authority to give them direction in life. And so that's what you're going to be talking to us about this evening, is about the authority of the Scripture and the authority for it to really give direction to us in life and something that we can trust that will help us navigate in a good way that can only make our lives more abundant. Very important topic. So I can't wait to hear what you have to say for us. So we're going to listen to this short clip here that's going to introduce the subject, and then we'll be hearing from you. Very good. Let's watch the clip. A question for you. What's the deal with the Bible? You know, the best-selling book of all time. The one you can find inside of virtually every hotel room in America. Let me get this straight. It's called the Word of God. But it's written by a bunch of people. And if it's written by people, doesn't that sort of, I don't know, ruin it? Because let's face it. People ruin stuff. They make mistakes. They mislead. They manipulate. People have motives. So what about that book? How can we trust the Bible? What do you think of the Bible? Seems like there are as many opinions about the Bible as there are stars in the sky. As you visit with people, your friends and neighbors, and you might ask them the question, what is your view of the Bible? You are going to get so many different answers, and that in and of itself is something uh, that certainly would make Satan very happy. The idea of a lot of confusion, a lot of people with a lot of different opinions is one that is... Uh, something Satan would be happy about. But when we're serious in thinking about this, there's really only two opinions. You either believe the Bible is from God, or you do not believe the Bible is from God. It all boils down to do those two fundamental views of the Bible. So what do you think? Do you think the Bible is from God, or do you think the Bible is from men? Well, of course, how you answer that question is also going to impact how you treat the Bible, how you understand the Bible, and whether you, you even give the Bible any time at all. I know people in my life have said, I don't believe the Bible is from God. I believe it's written by a bunch of men. As a matter of fact, one of the questions that was submitted is saying that very thing, that I, I don't think the Bible, it's just a, a bunch of uh, stories that were told by men. Well, if that's the way that you view the Bible, then, of course, you're not going to see the Bible as authoritative at all. If you believe that it's from the only true God, then you're going to want to study it. You're going to want to memorize it. You are going to want to do uh, what it says to the best of your ability. If you believe it's from God, then you recognize that it is God's message to you. And so it definitely becomes an authority in your life. 
If you believe it is from man, you're going to treat it like you would all other books written by man. A man-made book doesn't need to be obeyed. A man-made book is not going to be the basis of judgment. And so if it's written by a man, then it can be discarded. It can be rejected. It can be uh, totally refused. And so there is the fundamental difference. It is the question of the ages. It is the most important question that we could ask. Think about it this way. If there is a God, and we believe there is, and the Bible is from God, the Bible says that there is going to be a day of judgment. There is a great day coming. A great day of judgment of which all people are going to be brought before the throne of God and judged. The Bible says that. Now, if the Bible is accurate, and there is going to be this day of judgment, then what is my condition? How prepared or unprepared am I going to be in order to face God on the day of judgment? Because God would say, you had a Bible, you owned, you owned a Bible, but you chose to reject it. And the reason you chose to reject it is because you listened to this one critic who said the Bible is full of contradictions, or you listen to this one uh, critic who doesn't even believe that there is a God, or you listen to this man that's got all of these academic degrees and he's a whole lot smarter than I am and if he doesn't believe the Bible or he doesn't believe in God, then, then why should I? Do you think any of those excuses are going to resonate with God? That God is going to say, yeah, you were sort of misled by some of the academics of your time, and so uh, come on into my heaven anyway. No, he's not going to say that. He already says that each one of us are going to be judged on the basis of the decisions that we have made in our lives, the choices that we have made in our lives. It is my firm conviction that the Bible is from the only true God, and he inspired men to write down his very words. This is a claim the Bible makes. And it is an amazing, important, astounding claim. The Bible is making the claim that it is the Word of God. Now the idea that if you believe in a God, that He would communicate is one that a lot of people through the ages have believed. But the idea that this God would then put His communication down in writing is something that is a little bit different than that. For example, there are people in our world today that say that they have dreams and visions, that God speaks to them directly. Well, does the Bible confirm that that's the way God communicates with people today? Does God say that He might reach out to you in a dream, or He might uh, give a revelation to you through uh, a vision? <clears throat> well. The, actually, the opposite is true. One of the writers of the New Testament, a man by the name of Paul, who was inspired of God to write God's words down, said this, All Scripture is inspired of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction and training in righteousness, that the man of God might be thoroughly equipped, furnished into every good work. The Bible is what equips us. The Bible is what directs us and provides us the way that we should live our lives. Let's throw another word into that. It is the authority. Think of what that passage in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 and 17 is saying. That the man of God might be thoroughly equipped, furnished into every good work. So the Bible serves as the authority. All right, so when we think about the claim of that passage in 2 Timothy 3, first of all, it's talking about Scripture. All right, first, and the word Scripture, as I mentioned in the previous session, is a Greek word, graphe. We've got English words that come from that word. And it's a word that occurs about 50 times in the New Testament, and it means that which is written down. The people of biblical times knew the difference between holy writ or holy writing and the writings of men. And those were separated from each other. 
And they understood that that separation uh, needed to exist because you had God that inspired men to write, and then you had other men that chose to write on uh, their, their own, but they weren't inspired. Now, some claim to be inspired, but the people of God knew better than that. And so they rejected their writings. And so what 2 Timothy 3 is telling us is that God is, in fact, one that has spoken to man and that what he has spoken is written down. Now, there are two observations that verse, 2 Timothy 3.16, makes about Scripture. First of all, it is inspired. The word there is a Greek word, theonoustos. And the reason why I point out that word is because you might have heard the word uh, God, theos, from Greek, in uh, some of your own study. And the, so it's a compound word that means literally God breathed. Now, think about that. You cannot say words without breath. You draw the air into your lungs and then the muscles contract and you force the air out over uh, your lungs and throw through the formation of your lips and your tongue, you make words. That passage is saying that what is written down in our Bibles is that which is God-breathed. Well, that logically must mean or necessitate every word that is recorded in the Bible. All right, so the Bible is claiming to be from God. As I mentioned in the earlier session, it does this a lot. It claims to be from God a lot, and I'll say more about that in just a minute. So we either believe the Bible's from God or we believe it's a lie. And the second part of that passage of 2 Timothy 3.16 that's talking about Scripture, not only is it God-breathed, but it's profitable. It is the book that is going to be profitable for how we should live our lives. Now, remember that as we get into the second part of this particular session, because one of the questions that I want to address in, in this particular session, is the Bible really the book that we should use as the guide for our life? And I understand the, what I got from the question was not just in worship, although it would include that, is the Bible the guide for how we should worship, but what kind of father should I be? What kind of husband should I be? What, does the Bible say anything about grandparents? Does the Bible say anything about how children should react to their parents? Does the Bible give us any direction as far as what kind of neighbor I should be or what kind of person I should be in the workplace? So when we think about the the role the Bible should play, is it an authority? Is it the authority, men, for the kind of man you should be as a husband, as a father, as a worker? Ladies, what about you? Is the Bible an authority in your life? Well, this is the question that is certainly a very important question, and the reason why is because if it is an authority in our lives, then God's going to hold us accountable. For that. He's, our judgment is not going to be based solely upon worship, but also what kind of father I was, what kind of husband I was, what kind of worker I was in the workplace. Because the Bible is given direction on how we need to live in all of those uh, various venues and aspects of life. All right, so the question then that was given is, the Bible the only authority for given direction for life? Are there other books out there that are every bit as important or every bit as authoritative as the Bible? I had a friend who was an atheist, and over the course of time, he came to believe that God did exist. He looked at the various evidences for God, the fact that this world is something that could not have just happened. It, had, it shows design, and if you have design, then you have to have, to have a designer. And so he said, I, I am no longer an atheist. I now believe that there is a God. I said, that's great news. I'm so happy to hear that. He said, but I have a real problem with the Bible. I believe in God, 
But I'm not so sure I'm believing all the Bible rhetoric. I'm hearing uh, it's the word of God and it's it said, I'm not sure I'm buying that. So I asked him the question. I said, all right, if you believe in God and you said you now do, if God was going to communicate to man in writing, what would be your expectations of that writing if it came from God? And he thought about that for a minute and he said, well, if it really was from God, then it would have to be something that uh, was without flaw. It didn't have any mistakes. Uh, it would have information in it that only an all-knowing God would know. It would be accurate in every sense. And I said, you know what you've just done? I said, what's that? I said, you've just described the Bible. And he said, show me how that is the case. So tonight, let's do the same thing. Why is it that the Bible has the right to be the authority? The reason, the short answer to that, is because the Bible separates itself from all other writing. Now, I know that there are other religious books out there, but the Bible is standalone when it comes to various evidences that there is a God behind the book. And let's consider some of those evidences. First of all, we have to acknowledge the fact that the Bible does claim inspiration. While this is not evidence, it nevertheless is very important. Why? Because there's no sense our attaching a designation on the Bible that the Bible doesn't claim for itself. If the Bible doesn't claim to be from God, then we're under no obligation to, to believe that. But yet the Bible does and frequently does claim to be from God. We mentioned that passage in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, but that's just one of literally thousands of claims that are found in the pages of the Bible. For example, in the prophetic books of the Old Testament, you've got 12 minor prophets, you've got the, uh, the, the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, Ezekiel, and Daniel. In those writings alone, 2,500 times you have the claim and God said or in the Lord said that is an amazing amount of repetition now if you had a Bible and you went to the very last page of the Old Testament and looked at the page number well my Bible the the last page of my Bible is well 1551 so I've got 1,551 pages in the Old Testament. Your Bible may have anywhere from 700 to maybe even more than that. Now think about it this way. Just in the prophetic books alone, you've got 2,500 times that it claims to have uh, come from God. In my Bible, that's one and a half times on average per page. Now, if you have a Bible that has 800 pages, you're looking at, on average, three times a page the Bible is claiming to be from God. Now, in the earlier session, I made this, uh, this point. You don't have to believe that. God has given us the right to reject the claim of the Bible. Say, I don't, I don't believe the Bible's from God. What you cannot reject is that the Bible is claiming to be from God. That is something that is undeniable and irrefutable. It is thousands of times claiming to be from God. So that's the very first place that we start, that it is making this claim. So now here we are with this obvious decision that we need to make on the Bible and the authority that the Bible should have. If I accept the claim of the Bible that it is from God, then I also need to acknowledge that it needs to be the authority in my life. If it's from God, then it's the authority for my life. Or if I'm saying, I see that the Bible's making the claim to be from God, I'm not buying it, I reject it, well, then you can do what you want. And you can believe what you want, 
and you can practice what you want, but there is a great risk involved. I'm presently in a discussion with uh, another man who is an atheist and trying to talk about evidences, but the one point that keeps coming up is, but what if you're wrong? What if there is a God? What if the Bible is going to be the basis of judgment on the day, uh, the day of judgment? Where does that put you? And he said, I'm going to be in a really bad place. Well, it just so happens the Bible describes um, that bad place, and you don't want to go there. So there's a lot at stake here. And therefore, wisdom should motivate us to get to the bottom of this very important question. Is it the authority or not? Is it what I need to do in my life or not? But we recognize that the Bible most certainly does claim to be from God. All right, so getting back to my discussion with my uh, former atheist, now believing in God friend, but he's not sure about the Bible. So what is it that would make the Bible something that you could and would believe that it's from God? Well, first of all, consider the historical accuracy of the Bible. While we've discovered countless books that record uh, historical events, they are full of historical inaccuracies. And so, as a result, these histories have become somewhat suspect. The Bible, though, has been proven again and again and again to be exactly correct when it records historical details. And what's amazing about that is, as we have gone through time and we have criticized the Bible, said, well, we think it's wrong there. We think the Bible recorded an event, or a place, or a people that really didn't exist. Well, those things have been proven, uh, actually, that, that the Bible was right all along. Man through the centuries have questioned names, dates, places, people recorded in the Bible. But as times pass, the Bible is proven to have uh, been accurate in all those things. The world's foremost archaeologist, Dr. William Albright, made this comment, and that was that archaeology has never once found anything that contradicts what the Bible said. Now, there have been thousands of archaeological discoveries. Many of those are related to things that the Bible has claimed. And there has never been one archaeological discovery that contradicted what the Bible had said. That is an amazing truth. It's impossible. It is impossible to test the Bible on every point because archaeology and history hasn't confirmed every point, literally, thousands of references that are in the Bible. So there's not going to be external evidence uh, to either support or deny everything that's in the Bible. But one thing that continues to happen is that archaeologists continue to do their work. And as they continue to do their work, there are more things discovered. And with each new discovery is more uh, corroboration and verification of what the Bible has taught. So in what areas is the Bible proven to be accurate, especially historically, in areas that at one time were considered, the Bible was considered to be wrong? Well, uh, topographical information and geographic information is one of them. There have been those through the years that have said, the Bible is wrong on where this uh, uh, city was or where these people lived. And so that was what was reported in the textbooks and was one of the, the criticisms of the Bible is these guys that wrote the Bible just missed it uh, in some of their geographic or topographical references. And then some archaeologists somewhere un uncover some documents or they uh, start uncovering a tell, an archaeological site, an ancient city, and lo and behold, the Bible was right, exactly right on where it said those people lived or that city was located. So as excavations are made, every discovery that's been made has been in harmony with biblical teaching. There's not another book. There's not another book that records ancient history that can make that claim. Only the Bible. Well, how about ethnological? When we think about 
uh, the, the table of nations in Genesis chapter 10, as well as in other places, has proven to be exactly correct. As we learn more about the establishment of peoples and nations and the movement of those peoples, it is that which lines up perfectly with the Bible. What about various events, such as the Egyptian slavery of the Israelites? It's been established outside of the Bible. Uh, even the biblical claim that the Israelites had to build bricks with straw, then with stubble, then with nothing. Those are kind of things that you wouldn't think are provable or verifiable, but they have been. How about the ancient city of Jericho? Well, archaeologists have confirmed that the, the walls of that ancient city did fall through uh, some catastrophe. And the Bible says that that particular location was never going to be rebuilt. Well, guess what? If you go to uh, Israel today and you go to the ancient city of Jericho, that's all it is. It's just a dirt hill with the ruins of the ancient city. So when we think about what it is that the Bible has said historically, it's right every single time. Now, if you believe that the Bible was from God, then you'd expect that to be the case. Well, it is the case when it comes to the Bible. There are so many other things that have been found as, by way of illustration as far as archaeology is concerned. This is the, the Code of Hammurabi. It was something that was discovered in the early 1900s, and it was a, a, a black stone that had six feet in, cir, uh, circumfer in uh, circumference at the bottom and then uh, five at the top, and it was filled with ancient laws. Now, the dating of this particular uh, Code of Hammurabi is 2250 B.C. Now, what was already always said about the Bible back in the early centuries was that there's no way that the laws of Moses and the writing during the period of Moses could have happened because writing and laws developed much, much later than the time that Moses is uh, portrayed as living, which is about 1400 B.C. And so, again, that was a criticism of the Bible, and a lot of people rejected the Bible because it basically was given us false information about the development of nations and laws and of writing, and then an archaeologist discovers the Code of Hammurabi that predated the age of Moses by about 800 years. And it had a lot, of, a lot of laws exactly that were reflected in the Bible itself. So all of a sudden, people are going to have to go back and rewrite their textbooks that criticize the Bible by saying there's no way that language could have been developed by, that, there, by then. There's no way laws existed by then. Well, this confirmed that that was uh, certainly not the case, that they did in fact have laws. This is the Tel El Amarna tablets, another uh, tablets that were discovered uh, fairly recently by archaeologists, written about 1400 B.C. And what's interesting is that it affirms the existence of the Israelites, something that people had questioned, and it also verifies and mentions the name of the city of Jerusalem. It talks about the, the, the wars between the Canaanites and the Israelites, all of which confirm and verify the Bible. Now, you might have already believed all of these things and not doubted, but there are a lot of people in the world and maybe some that are watching tonight that have said, I don't think the Bible is from God, but think about the accuracy, the incredible, amazing accuracy of the Bible as far as history is concerned. One atheist said that the example of the Hittites... Mentioned in the Bible is proof that the Bible is full of fables and uh, fairy tales because of these people of the Hittites which the Bible portrays as being a huge nation of people. And then, lo and behold, guess what archaeology discovered? They discovered the ancient city of Hattusas, a massive city, and it had all of its laws. It talked about its geographical areas and so on. And so all of a sudden, the Bible was proven 
historically accurate. Whereas critics had said that a massive uh, nation of people are not just going to vanish off the face of the earth. Well, they most certainly did. But because of archaeological discovery, they were found. Well, how about something else? How about the Bible and science? The Bible has been proven to be scientifically accurate. As we all know, men have been wrong about a number of things through the years as far as science is concerned. For example, men thought the world was flat, and they believed that for centuries of time. Yet the Bible always maintained that the earth was round, like Isaiah 40 and verse 22. Science once thought that man hatched from white worms that came out of the Nile River. Well, science uh, has learned a little bit better than that, but the Bible always talked about the genuine origins of mankind. So when we think about the Bible and science, there are so many things about the Bible that has been proven to be true, including the number of stars. The Bible always said that the number of stars was innumerable, like the sand on the seashore. Well, up until fairly recent times, men count, counted the stars, thought they could count the stars. And as more powerful telescopes were developed, they realized that there are millions, no, billions no trillions of stars, and there's no way they can count all of them. Well, why it was it that it took all of our modern telescopes in order to confirm that? Well, it did, but the Bible said it all along. So the Bible has been proven to be right uh, scientifically and in so many different areas about both man and woman possessing the seed of life. The Bible confirms something like that. Um, the idea of there being a void of stars in the north, Job 26. Uh, there are the, um, uh, the evaporation cycle, the water cycle, was something that the Bible had uh, established in the book of Ecclesiastes, but modern science just recently uh, came to realize this. The, um, it just goes on and on when we think about what science has learned that confirms what the Bible already said. How about medicine? The Bible has been proven to be exactly accurate as far as medicine is concerned. As a matter of fact, when we think about the, uh, the various laws of uh, one's own hygiene, the Bible was something that established that long before uh, modern medicine even learned about some of those things. Uh, one particular doctor wrote a book called None of These Diseases, Health Secrets for the 21st Century, written by S.I. McMillan. And he had written an earlier book called None of These Diseases, uh, and so then he followed it with uh, Health Secrets for the 21st Century. And he demonstrated how the Israelites were unique in their understanding of the human body. No one else, none of the other nations believed what the Israelites believed about the human body. None of the other nations had the practices about food laws and personal hygiene that the Israelites did. So why were the Israelites doing something as far as taking care of themselves different than everybody else? Because they were given information from the God who created the Bible. You have to have an explanation on why they knew stuff about the body that was right and everybody, nobody else did. Well, that is what you would expect from a document that came from God. <clears throat> the Bible is unbelievably accurate when it comes to prophecy. Hundreds of Bible prophecies have been made and we think, well, there are people like Nostradamus that, that make prophecies, and they're uh, accurate in some of those prophecies. Well, that's the key, though. It's some of those. But the Bible has never had a prophecy not come true. Now, we, we do acknowledge that there are some prophecies that are yet future. But when the Bible predicted things in a particular time frame or context, it was always 
accurate. There was one a professor by the name of Peter W. Stoner that uh, wrote a particular book called Science Speaks that he revised that book in 2005. He systematically went through 11 Old Testament prophecies and talked about the chances of your accurately predicting these various Bible prophecies. So if I had a coin and I said, all right, guess heads or tails, well, you've got a 50-50 chance, since the coin has two sides, of accurately predicting which side of the coin it's going to land on. But when we look at these Bible prophecies, what are the chances of your predicting that a city is going to be made flat like a rock? All of the building materials are going to be scraped and thrown into the sea. Like in Ezekiel 26, a prophecy that was made about the ancient city of Tyre. Well, that's a pretty specific prophecy. What about saying that the ancient city of Tyre, like Jericho, was never going to be rebuilt? Do you know one of the commodities that are so, that's so precious in the, the Bible lands is drinking water? Well, the ancient location of the city of Tyre has enough fresh water to support a very large modern city. But yet, today, it's still flat like a rock. It's never been rebuilt. The Bible said it would never be rebuilt. What are the chances of a prophecy like that being made? Ultimately, you're going to have to agree with what God himself says in Isaiah 44, and that is, who knows the future but me? And God is predicting what it was that was going to take place with lots of prophecies. Do you know that there are about 300 prophecies made about Jesus Christ in the Old Testament? And we know that those prophecies were made before Jesus lived because the Old Testament was already done and completed by about uh, 400 B.C., 400 years before Christ. But yet, the prophecies of what was going to happen to him, including his death and his resurrection, were made in these Old Testament books. You've got to point to God. So if the Bible is from God, then it's going to have accuracy and prophecy. And then what about the idea of ethics, morals, uh, and our values? It isn't logical to believe that God would not venture to uh, give us direction in the way that we should live our lives. And that's one of the primary questions uh, that was asked in this series as far as the Bible and the authority that it has in our lives. Is this the way that we should view the Bible? Does it impact me and the way that uh, I conduct myself uh, as a husband and father and so on? When we think about the ethics and morals, God is holy. The Bible tells us that He is holy and we are to be holy like He is holy. So that's an authoritative statement being made. You are to be holy as I am holy, says the Lord God, 1 Peter chapter 1. That's the authority that the Bible claims. All right? <clears throat> but if the Bible is from God, we would expect it to give the, the perfect values of life and morality, the right kind of advice for uh, what takes a successful marriage, how parents should uh, raise children, and so on. And the Bible does all of that, and it's been proven that the Bible does, in fact, have the perfect moral code. So how do you see the Bible? If you see the Bible the way it presents itself, it is undeniable that its source is God. And if its source is God, then it should serve to be authoritative. Now, a second question, though, that was asked in the, the time that we have left is, why is it so hard to understand? God, if God is the author of the Bible, then why, does it, why is it so tough to understand it? Well, first of all, we have to understand that there are passages like Revelation 20, verses 11 and 12, that describes the day of judgment. And on that day of judgment, it says, and books were open, and when a book was open, which was the book of life and the dead, were judged 
according to the things that are written in the books. All of us are going to be judged by the Bible books. The reason it says books is because there was one law for the patriarchals in the Old Testament, one law that was given through Moses, the Mosaic law, and now we are in the Christian age, and it's our responsibility to follow uh, what is called the New Testament, the 27 books of the New Testament. So the Bible says you're going to be judged by that book, but it's hard to understand. But yet Jesus still says, John 12 and verse 48, he, one who rejects me and does not receive my words, has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. So the Bible definitely claims that we're going to be judged by the Bible, by what the Bible says. And Jesus says, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. So that's how we become sanctified. It becomes the authority. But God has provided. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. All right, so God has not left us without information. He has given us that information, and now it's our responsibility to do something with that information. But let's return, though, to the question. All right, so now I'm being told that I'm going to be judged by this book, and it's a hard book to understand. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, one of the apostles of Jesus Christ wrote, that the writings of another apostle, Paul, are difficult to understand, are hard to understand. So he acknowledges that there are par parts of the Bible that are hard to understand. And so if someone says, I don't think the Bible's all that tough. Well, even Peter said that there are things that are tough. But notice this. He doesn't say impossible to understand. He just says they're hard. All right, so if something is hard, then what does that mean? Well, I just need to work harder. I need to be more committed. And so there are things in the Bible that are hard to understand, but they're not impossible to understand. We'll say more about that later. So what are you supposed to do? Well, passages like 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15 says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a workman who... Workman a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing, or some versions say handling, the word of truth. So you're going to have to be diligent, and you're going to have to be willing to be a worker. Someone that just does a surface reading of the Bible uh, may become very confused. But passages like this tell us truth can be learned, but you need to be diligent and you need to be willing to be a worker. There are so many passages that talk about that the Bible can be understood. Ephesians 5.17, the Apostle Paul there writes, but don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4 says, God desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So, God wants you to know the truth. God wants you to understand. 2 Peter 3.18, grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. James 1.17 says, God, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. Well, God is not going to give you something that is all muddied and confusing, confusing and you could never possibly understand it. And the Matthew 13 talks about the parable of the sower, which we talked about in the earlier session. There are four different kinds of people. And those who are willing to take the Bible and invest time in studying it are going to emerge with an understanding. But think about it this way. If one argues we can't understand the Bible, what are they really saying? First of all, they're saying that God's not smart enough. He wasn't smart enough to come up with something that we could all understand. And so to say that we can understand the Bible is actually an attack upon the very nature and character of God himself. Or they might say, well, God's not powerful enough. 
He's, he wasn't able to produce something that people all over the world could come to understand. And so it's an attack on, uh, again, another attribute of God. They're also saying, if you're saying you can't understand the Bible, that God is not just. Why, is he, why would he be unjust? Because you're going to be judged by that book. How fair would it be on the day of judgment that we're going to be judged by a book that there's no way we could have understood? How fair would that be? How fair would it be for you to be judged on a book that was written in some language that you don't know? But that's the basis of your judgment. Well, I don't know what it said. Well, too bad. God would never do that uh, to us. And then... To say that we can't understand the Bible and understand it alike is to call God a liar because God says we can. God says we can understand the Bible and we can know what it is that we're supposed to believe and to do. So let's uh, uh, entertain some questions here, Clint. We've got some time left. Well, thank you again, Danny, for answering these questions. I, <clears throat> I have a compiled list of questions and as you have presented this the, 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 the prior session, and, and then this one, I was having to just check them off because you were answering the questions. Uh, and, wasn't that the idea? <laughs> <laughs> and these, uh, the, I, I do have three questions that all kind of go together that you, you've touched on, you've kind of answered, but these, these have come in during this session. Uh, so I'll just lump these three together and give you a couple minutes to answer these. Why does the Catholic Bible have more books than the, more books in the Old Testament? Number two, are we using the right Bible? What about the other ancient texts and other manuscripts and even other books that we don't have in the Holy Bible? And then the third one that goes with these two, the writer of the books in our current New Testament must have written a lot of things that are not in our Bible. How did people of that time know which letters and other writings of Jude, James, etc. were inspired and which were not? Very good questions. First of all, it is true that in the, the Catholic Bible, there are 11 additional books. Uh, Roman Catholicism calls them the deuterocanonical books, the deuterocanonical writings, and uh, that just means the, the second law, the second uh, group of writings. So you've got the 39 books of the Old Testament, and then you've got these 11 uh, books. You might know them better by another name, and that's the Apocrypha. Uh, the Catholics don't uh, care for that particular name, uh, they prefer deuterocanonical. But <clears throat> those writings were never accepted by the, the people of God. The Jews did not accept those writings. The early Christians did not accept those writings. They were those that uh, were rejected. It wasn't until the Council of Trent, which is in the 1500s, that the, the Catholic Council officially gave uh, credit to the apocryphal writings. And so those are... Uh, not inspired writings, and the people of God did not accept those writings. And that is uh, also an answer to another one of the questions that was just asked, and that is, how do we know uh, what to be, uh, is to be accepted and not? Well, the people of God, when the inspired writers would write these letters and they would give them to the people of God, they knew that they were to uh, collect these writings. Now, the question says we know that they did a lot of other writing. We really don't. The Bible does not uh, confirm that, for example, the Apostle Paul did a whole lot of other writing other than the 13 epistles that are ascribed uh, from him. We don't uh, know that to be the case at all. So when we think about what it is that we have in the Bible, we can have confidence that this process that was done and the collecting and the preserving of the, the books were the, the right ones. They are the, from God. They are accurately translated. We can have confidence. Another one of the questions that was asked has to do with the myriad of translations. You have to recognize that the Bible is, in fact, the number one seller by millions of copies. And so there's a lot of money to be made by producing a Bible that is sold. Well, as a result, uh, there are a lot of people that say, let's make another translation. And so we do have a lot of translations, but recognize 
those translations that have a committee of translators that were involved. There's some checks and balances that go along with those. Use major translations. Uh, use more than one translation when you study the Bible, and you should be fine. Thank, thanks again very much. Thank you so much for your, your, your insight and for all, all the study that, that you've put into the, the, the background and to provide this, this, this information about the Bible for us. Uh, as, as Richard mentioned, Denny is the, the president of the Bear Valley Bible Institute of Denver. Uh, if you have any interest in learning more about the Bible Institute, the website for the, the Bible Institute is wetrainpreachers.com. It's wetrainpreachers, all one word, dot com. It's school that is known for producing excellent preachers. On behalf of the Linda Road Church of Christ, on behalf of OneQuestion.net, thank you so much for spending your time with us. I went to Bear Valley. Thank you so much for, for spending your time with us here this evening. We're going to take about a 30-minute break at this point, and we'll be back in 30 minutes, and we'll be live streaming again. At, and at that point, our own Richard Sutton will be answering your questions about salvation, questions like, how do I know I can go to heaven? What, what must I do to be saved? So again, thank you so much for spending your time with us here this evening. We invite you to be back with us in 30 minutes.